All right, so today we're talking about change in arithmetic sequences. I know for a fact this isn't brand new um, and that you absolutely do it in Algebra 1. Pretty sure you might probably do it before Algebra 1 also and maybe a little bit after. But I know that for a fact because um, a, an Algebra 1 teacher came and had me print out something last week and it was on the same topic. I was like, oh, that's what I'm about to do too. So there you go. So that should tell you that today's lesson should be pretty basic and kind of a review. Um, so we're going to talk about sequences. So a sequence is a function, okay, so all things that relate to functions relate to this, from, okay, thank you. Where's Jenny? Wait, oh, there you are. Sorry, I moved all around the room. You should have taken care of girl. Is a function from the whole numbers to the real numbers. So here's what that means. From when it says like from the whole numbers to the real numbers. That means your whole numbers are your inputs. And real numbers are your outputs. So when we're talking sequences, your inputs can only be whole numbers. Whole numbers are the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, plus 0. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all those whole numbers, those are your whole numbers. No negatives. No negatives, no fractions, no decimals. You, you can't input any of that stuff. But then your output just has to be a real number, which means I can have a fraction, I can have a decimal, I can have a negative. All right, so inputs and outputs there. And I think that's basically what this next part says. This means that we are only able to plug in whole numbers into a sequence, but we can get any real number as the output, okay? any real number. As a result, when we graph a sequence, we will have points, but we cannot connect them together to form a line. So we are not connecting the dots. It's what is called discrete data. We wouldn't be able to say like, um, we have an interval from one to five. Instead, my Domain would be one, two, three, four, five. Like you literally have to list them out. So this says consider the sequence defined by a sub n equals four n minus three. So a sub one, that means I'm just replacing n with one. A sub one would simply be equal to four times one minus three, which is super easy, right? But first step in anything you do is substitute it in zero work. I don't care how easy it is, and this is pretty easy, okay? Pretty sure you know four times one is four, but you have to show that you substituted it in. After that, skipping any steps, that's totally fine, but that is a very important step that some of us don't always quite comprehend. So four times one is four, minus three gives me one. Then we find a seven. That's equal to four times seven minus three. Again, first step, zero work, substitute it in. And then if you want to write 28 minus 3, you can, but you don't have to. And 28 minus 3 would just be 25. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Super easy. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to talk about two important types of sequences, arithmetic today, geometric tomorrow. So this, they are arithmetic sequences, not arithmetic sequences. It's one of the horrible things about the English language. We um, spell things exactly the same and then pronounce them differently. And, you know, that's not supposed to be confusing at all. But, um, and they basically kind of, kind of mean the same thing, but not really. So it's an arithmetic sequence. So we'll first talk about property of successive terms. So successive terms are terms right next to each other, like terms 6 and 7, or terms 9 and 10, but not 6 and 10 because they're not one right after another. So successive terms have a common Difference. Common difference is labeled with a lowercase d. And it says, or a constant rate of change, which that should sound familiar to us, that means they are linear. So your arithmetic sequences, always linear functions. One of the main ways they differ from other linear functions we've been doing is that this is discrete data, and you just plot the points, you do not connect them because there's no in between, no in between one and two. There are two basic formulas 
your equations. Um, if you're only going to know one, which I think we would prefer no, to know just one and not two of different ones, is this one right here because that'll work for everything. And remember, you do not get a reference chart on the AP exam um, at all. There's not one at all. But if they, if you need certain things, sometimes they'll give you little formulas or they give you like the, what they're looking for in regression. I haven't seen any questions that deal with sequences where they actually gave you that. Like you need to know that and you need to see how it relates to a linear function, then it's not that big of a deal to remember. But in these two, a sub zero, that just means that is my initial value. It's also like the y-intercept when you're thinking about linear. D, where I already said over here, this is the common difference. And that's really just the slope. So we're talking about slope and y-intercept. Because if you look up here, doesn't this kind of look like y equals mx plus b? Except there's different letters. It's basically what's happening is that um, that's your common difference or your slope. That's your y-intercept, right? But notice that they're flipped around from what we usually look at for y equals mx plus b. And then a sub k, which shows up in this one. Well, a sub n represents the nth term. So a sub k represents the kth term, which doesn't really narrow it down, I know, and sounds weird. But it just means like if the nth term, a sub n is really a sub 3, then I need another term. That would be like a sub 7 then that's, that represents a sub k. It's just giving you a different, um, just a different term. That's all it is. So arithmetic sequences behave like linear functions, except they are not continuous. You are not connecting the dots. This here says increasing arithmetic sequences increase equally, which means the slope is the same. But that's what a constant rate of change is. That's what makes it linear. And also decreasing they decrease equally on each step. That's kind of a strange statement to me that's put here, but really it just means you have a constant rate of change. That's all it is. All right, so let's look at this first example where we're supposed to graph. And here's my a sub n equation. And then look at, compare it to this right here, right? This is in what I would kind of consider y equals mx plus b form. And if you remember the other day when we did a regression, even though that's what we're comfortable with, that's what we're used to say, seeing, it had us flip it around and it was like a plus bx. It was more like this because this is getting into the, you know, the statistical type of stuff. But it's the same thing rather, no matter how you flip those around, right? So that means here I can figure out a few things. If I look at this compared to this right here. What is, what would a sub zero be? What do you think that is? One, good. And then what is D? Three. This is your y-intercept, that's your, um, your slope, basically. All right, so we're gonna make a little t-chart here. And so we're gonna have n, and a sub n. And it will do 0, 1, 2, 3. And of course, we could keep on going, but remember, they have to be whole numbers. So I already know what a sub 0 is. That is 1. We have figured that out. Then if I want to do a sub 1, I substitute that in here. 3 times 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4. So what is a sub 2? 7. And a sub 3, 10. Okay. Then, writing with my knuckles over here, we are going to plot those points. So I got 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 7. And then 3, 10 goes off the chart, so oh, it's fine. I get those three on there. Um, do I connect the dots? No, I absolutely do not. Um, there you go. All right? Fairly simple? Yes? Okay. Any questions at all? All right. Good deal. So then it says for each of the following, we're going to determine if the sequence could be arithmetic. If yes, identify the common difference. So look at A. Do you think that would be an arithmetic sequence? 
No, why not? It's what? It's, it has a squared, it's quadratic, right? Or it's not linear. Even like if you can't identify what it is, as long as you know it's not linear, really any of those things that I think I sort of heard would probably be fine. So we would say, ooh, not like that. We would say not arithmetic. And my reason then would be, I can just say that it's not linear. Okay, because it has to be linear, right? So what do you think about B? Do you think it's arithmetic? Yes, because that's linear, right? So I can say that it is arithmetic. And what is D? Negative 2. Good. Oh, because one thing I forgot to point out up here was that we already knew what the comment, like we knew what D was. We knew all that before we did this. But if I look at this here now, the difference here is 3, the difference here is 3, the difference here is 3. Remember how we were finding common differences before? Your common difference is 3. That's what that is. Not only that, but because the differences between your inputs are all 1, not only is this the common difference, but it's also the slope. Because to find the slope, I'd put 3 over 1 each time. Does that make sense to you? So that's another thing that just makes it linear. That's your common difference. That's why we call it that. That's what's happening there. Okay, we good on that? Okay, good deal. All right, let's look at C then. Now I can't. I don't have. I don't have the equation. I don't need to come up with the equation. I just need to look at the differences. And remember, when you do the differences, you have to do them in the correct order to get the right number. It is not negative seven minus a negative two. It's negative two minus a negative seven. And what would that give you? Five. And then what is three minus a negative two? Five. 8 minus 3 is 5. So it's looking good, but I can't stop here because with the next one 6, then it doesn't work, right? So you got to check everything you have, and this difference here is also 5. So we can say it is arithmetic. And we just found that the common difference is 5, which means my slope is 5. So if I'm going to put it in this this sort of y equals mx plus b form, I know what to do with that. But I don't always have, just like um, I've said, you know, y equals mx plus b is an evil, but we don't really use it unless we have, um, unless we have the y-intercept, then we would use that. That's kind of what's happening here. Unless we have a sub zero, we wouldn't really be using that one. And that's why the other one is a little bit better. All right, so then I'll look at my differences here. So negative two minus one is what? Negative three. And then 3 minus a negative 2 is 5. Do I need to go any farther? No. Because once they don't match, you can stop. If they do match, you have to keep going. So then this one, I could just say this is not arithmetic. Now, this, when I said it was not arithmetic over here, I gave a reason and said, because it's not linear. There I said it's not arithmetic. This basically is my reason. Like sometimes just your work, the little stuff you show, just that, that's not even that much, that is your explanation and that is totally fine. Okay? What questions do we have at this point? We good? All right, flip it over. So this says let a sub n be an arithmetic sequence. They give me a sub 3 is equal to 8, d is equal to negative 4. I need to find an expression for a sub n and then use it to find a sub 12. So it's asking me for two things. It's not all about finding a sub 12. Like I have to actually have this say, this is a sub n. I could use it for anything, but now I'm gonna use it for a sub 12, all right? The two equations that we have, a sub n equals a sub zero plus d times n. The other one is a sub n equals a sub k plus d times n minus k. This is very similar to the slope-intercept form. This is very similar to the point-slope form. Okay. So when I'm done, like once I write my a sub n, a sub n and n should still be in the equation, but I should have something that's replaced everything else, right? So since they gave me, they gave me d, I've got that right there, but then this right here, 
this is what's going to be my a sub k, right? So a sub 3 is a sub k, which means a sub k equals 8. What does k equal? 3. See, a sub 3, a sub k, k would be 3, right? But a sub k would be 8. Make sure you get the two numbers correct, like the subscript matches the subscript and so forth and so on. So we're going to start with this expression. And again, I don't know my initial term, so I'm not using that one. I pretty much have to use this one over here. So I have a sub n equals, what is a sub k? 8 plus d, which is a negative 4, times n minus, what is k? 3. Any questions about where any of the numbers come from? Yes, ma'am. Because that is the only one they give me. If they only give me one, that is my a sub k. Does that make sense? That's a very good question. But that's how I knew. It's not going to be a sub n because after I write it, this is like a sub n has to stay there. a sub k has to get replaced. So it's just some term. They only gave me one, so that's the one I have to use. Does that help? Good question. What else you got? Okay. Now, if this was a multiple choice question and they're asking me for an a sub n, uh, formula, I don't think any of your answer choices would look exactly like this. If they don't simplify, what I think it would look like is these parentheses would be gone, and so would the plus sign. But because I was filling it in and it was negative, that's why I put it in parentheses. Instead, it might look like 8 minus 4 times n minus 3. You with me on that? We'll just kind of fix that a little bit. But another option is that we can actually distribute and get it into this form. Now, it doesn't say right here that we have to. We're going to on this one because I just want you to make sure you know what to do in, in case you're trying to match it with an answer choice. So I could keep going and put 8 and then negative. I'm going to distribute, right? So negative 4 times n is negative 4n. Negative 4 times negative 3 is a positive 12. So a sub n is equal to 20 minus 4n. Now, again, either one of these are totally fine and acceptable formulas for that, unless you are told what form it has to be in. Now, I know this question doesn't ask this, but given this, and we put it in this form, what is a sub 0? 20, because it looks just like this now, right? So this is like your y-intercept, this is your slope, right? And so your a sub 0 is 20. That is one good thing about that formula. You know exactly which one it is there, but it doesn't matter either way. So we have this. Now we have to find a sub 12. So I'm going to use, and I could use either one of these. I think since I have this, I'll use that one. It's a little bit more straightforward. It's going to be 20 minus 4 times 12. So you get 20 minus 48, and then a sub 12 is a negative 28. What questions do you have? Are we all okay on all that? Yes? All right. So example four looks similar, but it's not exactly the same. So it says, let a sub n be an arithmetic sequence, and this time it gives me two terms. I still need to find an expression for a sub n, and then I'm going to have to use it to find the 24th term. Now, regardless of which one I use up here, I have to know the common difference. They didn't tell me that. And if I had successive terms, like if this was five, a sub 5 and a sub 6, then I could just figure out what it, what it is from there. But I don't have that. Instead, I'm going to need to find that, and we're going to use this equation to do it. Now, I'm not, and I know I've said this many times, I'm not a big fan of memorization because I don't always think it gets stored in the right place, and I don't think you can always access it when you need to. So um, as far as knowing the equations, you have to learn them. And if you use a formula chart like a crutch, that's when you don't learn them. And by a crutch, I mean you look at it and you go, oh, that's it, and you just use it. If you actually write it down every time you need it, that's what's going to help you learn it. Think about your friends you have. Melvin, sit up. Um, did you go, when you learned them, did you go home and like make flashcards and learn their names that way with their pictures? 
No, that'd be a little weird, right? It'd be a tiny bit creepy. But instead, you've heard their names over and over again, and they just got committed to memory, right? That's a learning and not a memorizing type of thing. So think about it that way. So with that said, I mean, I can't force you to do it, but I suggest you do it. We're going to write it down every time we need it. A sub n equals a sub k. Oh, goodness. A sub k plus d times n minus k. So they gave me two terms, and I need the common difference. Now, one of those two terms is going to be my a sub k. The other one I can use is my a sub n. It really does not matter which one. You can't do it wrong. However, there is one way to do it where it makes your life here a teeny bit easier, but when we get to geometric, a lot easier. So we're just going to be consistent. So here's what I suggest that you do is that I... The only way I've ever seen them give you on really anything I've seen, if you're going to be given more than one term, they are, I hate to always, I say always, but I've never seen it any other way. Always they get like a sub two and then a sub six. Like they wouldn't put a sub six first. That's just weird, right? So they're kind of in order. So since these subscripts are in order from least to greatest, and one of these is a sub n and one of them is a sub k, we're going to put the subscripts in alphabetical order. Again, not wrong if you get them flipped around. And not even that bad here, but it'll make a bigger difference in geometric, and I'll show you that tomorrow. And once we get through this one, I'll explain to you how it makes it a little bit easier. So now look at what we have here. I, have, I know what a sub n is. I can substitute that in. I know what a sub k is. I can substitute that in. I don't know d. But I do know n and I do know k. So if I substitute all that in, this is my only unknown, and then I can find it. Does that make sense? All right, so what, as what I labeled, what is a sub n? 9. So 9 is equal to, what is a sub k? 7. Okay, plus d, which I do not know. And then what is n? 6. And k is 2. And I highly, highly suggest you actually label them like I did because it's so easy to pull the wrong number off. You know, have them labeled. So now we just have to solve. We can skip some steps. So like I can subtract 7 from both sides. That gives me 2 over here. And then 6 minus 2 is 4, so this gives me 4 times d. So then what is the common difference? Is it 2 or is it 1 half? 1 half. 2 is a very common wrong answer there because your brain sees the 4 and the 2 and you're like, oh, that's totally 2. Um, do you know better? Absolutely. But is it on the simple stuff where you're rushing through that you make mistakes? Absolutely. So you want to be careful. Now, this is kind of like when you use two points to find the slope, and then you just need one of them to write the equation of a line. Same type of thing. So now I have basically two points, or I have two terms. I only need one of them to write the equation of my line, or write my equation here. So um, I would say that, you know, clearly your uh, formula has k's in it. At this point, I'm done with this one. I needed him to help me find the common difference, but I don't need it anymore, so I'm going to mark it out so I don't like pull one thing off of one point and one off the other. Then I'm going to put it in here. So a sub n is equal to, what is a sub k? 7 plus, what is d? 1 half times n minus, what is k? 2. There's my equation for a sub n. Now, could I distribute and simplify some more? Yes, but if I don't have to, I'm not going to. I did on the last one just to show you that you, you can't. If Again, if I'm trying to match it up with an answer choice, maybe I need to. But I don't need to, so I'm going to leave it. If I had flipped these around, then this would be flipped around, which would have given me a negative number there, which, again, is not the end of the world. Um, I would have gotten the same thing in the end, but then you're dealing with negatives, and that's where other mistakes happen. Okay. Negatives with a geometric, way bigger, way bigger deal. But um, so like I said, that helps you a little tiny bit here, but whatever. So I've got my a sub n. Now I've got to find a24. Okay. So that's going to be equal to 7 plus 1 half times 24 minus 2. First step, zero work, substitute it in. Okay, that's where your points come from on things. Then, like I said, if you want to skip steps, totally fine. If you feel like, no, I never skip steps because I'm afraid I'm going to mess up, that's fine too. 24 minus 2 is 22. What's half of 22? 11. So I get 7 plus 11. So the 24th term 
is equal to 18. What questions do you have? We all good? Yes? All right. Okay, good questions. All right, last thing then. So now we have a graph, and we're going to use our same formula we've been using, a sub n is equal to a sub k plus d times n minus k. Now, you could totally use the other one here, but I'm choosing to only use one with you, so we only have one we really have to understand, and I think that just makes things a little bit better. But from here, since I have a graph in front of me here, what is a sub zero? Eight, right? When x, when x is zero, y is eight. Because it's, it's your y-intercept, basically. Now, I could use that. I could find another point. I could do what we just did on the one before. But I have a graph. If you have a graph that is a decent graph where you are not guessing at any, um, at any uh, values, like I, it's labeled. If it wasn't labeled, that'd be a problem. But I know that at, at one, I have six. So this y value is six, this y value is eight. Like that's a, very clear, so I can totally use it. So for my difference, remember it's just the slope. Is your slope positive or negative? Negative, okay. And then we can just count. To get from here to here, I have to go down two and over one, so it's negative two. Totally okay to do something like that. Now it says several terms of an arithmetic sequence are shown above. Find the expression for a sub n and use that expression to find a 17. All right, so we already have this. So I'm going to use this as a sub k. All right, because that's the term that I have. I have other terms, but I don't need them. I only needed one, so I'm good. So my a sub n is equal to a sub k, which is what? 8. And then minus 2 times n. And then what is k? 0. So n minus 0 is really just n, right? And then you're done. If you write n minus 0, totally fine. It doesn't matter. But... um. Like I said, we could have just used that other equation because it's in that form, but it works out nicely if you use that one anyway. It's not that big of a deal. So there's my a sub n formula. And then I got to come back in here and do the 20, or no, I'm sorry, the 17th term. So this is 8 minus 2 times 17. What's 2 times 17? 34. So it's 8 minus 34. Is my answer going to be positive or negative? Negative. Always think about that first before you do something backwards and weird. It's a negative. And then what is 34 minus 8? 26. And that is your answer. What questions do you have? The most difficult thing about all of this, which isn't necessarily that difficult, is really just going to be remembering that. I don't think that, you know, the work that's within this is necessarily that bad. We all good so far? All right, remember, when I give you your assignment today, you are skipping 1 through 6 for today, 7 through 12. And if you actually get on it, you could probably finish that before you leave.